Steve Biko, on behalf of the African National Congress of South Africa, I come to salute you and all the comrades in arms who have been murdered under torture. Sunday, September the 25th, 20,000 black South Africans came to mourn Steve Biko, the non-violent but militant black radical leader who died mysteriously in police custody. The South Africa... Sunday, September the 25th, 20,000 black South Africans came to mourn Steve Biko, the non-violent but militant black radical leader who died mysteriously in police custody. The South African government announced that Biko had died after a week-long hunger strike. Biko, who was in good health, was the 20th man to die in police custody since the June riots last year. The announcement was greeted internationally with shock and anger. Tonight, we explore why this man was so important and the likely impact of his death on the future of race relations in South Africa. Donald Woods is the editor of a leading South African newspaper and was a close friend of Steve Biko. Well, he was the special hero of the young black South African political activists. He articulated their philosophy for them. He was the founder of four movements which had a special bearing on their problems. And he was the, you might say, the spiritual head of them all and the advisor and guide of these movements. So he occupied a very special place. At the age of 30, he was just young enough to be acknowledged as the leader of the youth and just mature enough to be able to do so wisely. The Minister of Justice, James Kruger, the man ultimately responsible for the treatment of detainees, told a Nationalist Party conference that Biko's death left him cold. He also joked openly about it. But faced with an international outcry, he withdrew his earlier statement that Biko died in a hunger strike. If you look at all the reasons given down the years for the deaths of detainees, no reasonable person would believe most of them. Secondly, in Steve's case, I knew he would never harm himself physically in there. He had given me to understand quite plainly that if he was detained and he died in detention and it was alleged that he had done anything which brought about his death, such as um, hanging, you know, this is the one often given out, um, cutting himself something or suffocating himself, pillow, anything like that, or starvation. Um, then I, I would know it wasn't true. The inquest has yet to be held. In Washington, we spoke to an American senator who'd recently met Biko. He's the chairman of the Senate subcommittee on Africa, Dick Clark. I think it's uh, not clear what uh, Steve Biko's death will uh, have, or what kind of influence it might have on American policy. Certainly it's going to, I think, cause most Americans, uh, both in government and out, to be more and more reluctant to uh, have a relationship with South Africa. I've always felt that Prime Minister uh, Forster was right in saying that the United States couldn't meddle in South African policy, but I think we ought to meddle in our own, and that's what we're talking about. Should we continue investments and loans and other kinds of relationships with a government that participates in this kind of activity? Should we be supporting apartheid? That'll really be the question, I think, that we'll have to answer in this country. I think we come closer and closer after events of this kind to saying that we're ready to wash our hands of that. And if uh, Mr. Forrester and uh, the South African government want to uh, operate in this way, they're going to have to do it in a very isolated world as far as we're concerned. And Andrew Young, America's black ambassador to the United Nations, said when he heard the news... No nation can afford to lose its most dedicated and creative leadership and yet prosper. I know personally how much the United States suffered nationally as a result of the similarly tragic deaths of President John F. Kennedy, Martin Luther King, and Senator Robert F. Kennedy. Certainly a future non-racial South Africa will mourn the loss of a dedicated native son, Mr. Biko. Few people in Britain had ever heard of Steve Biko before his death, but one man who knew him well was Sir Robert Burley, the former headmaster of Eton. Yes, I was out in South Africa, I think it was in 1970. Uh, I'd been asked by the students at the English University at Durban 
to give a lecture on academic freedom, and after it, two of them took me along to the students, the, the African students' hostel for the medical school. And um, I had never heard of him before that, and I, do, I don't suppose many people had at that time. And, the, um, and I, I found him one of the most interesting young men I've ever met in my life, straight away, and uh, had an, an astonishing conversation with him, which um, at once convinced me that here was somebody who was going to mean something. He said to me, Mind you, there's got to be a white contribution too. We're not the only people in this country. And I thought when I heard that, I thought, now that's one of the most encouraging remarks I've heard. And I must say, it didn't surprise me altogether to find that he came from an African. The announcement of Biko's death led to memorial services throughout South Africa. In London, there was one at St Paul's Cathedral, attended by, among others, Foreign Secretary Dr David Owen. We have watched the men at their labor and have watched the overseer with hands folded sneer at the sweat as it trickled down their backs in the sweltering sun. And the world has seen the scene but says nothing. But still, we must finish the story. What does one say to you? Oh love, oh brother, for you are offered and you are in it. Yet we do not speak it with one another. For you and we are one. To understand why Steve Biko could inspire such powerful tributes, we went to South Africa, to his birthplace, a small town in the Eastern Cape called King Williamstown. He was banned here in 1973 because of his political activities. This meant he couldn't take part in public life or meet more than one person at a time, and he was forbidden to travel. King Williamstown is a typical, segregated, provincial South African town. The whites live comfortably in pleasant suburban streets. The blacks live outside it in shanty towns. The blacks have no civil rights. In this unlikely setting, Steve Biko turned King Williamstown into a centre for black radicalism, demanding equal rights for blacks and preparing the way for a multiracial society, breaking the apartheid system. A close friend and political associate of Steve Biko was Malusi Mpuluana. He had a way of, you know, of, of appealing to people on a social basis. You know, this first striking thing about him is that he, he is a very friendly person and a person that is always ready. He was quite selfless, you know, the person that is always ready to go out of his way to assist the next man. And uh, to a point where, you know, even in the township here where he stayed at Ginsburg, he was not a lawyer, but everybody that had a problem of whatever nature, they would go to his home, you know, just to consult him. Uh, you know, it became so much that it was sometimes very difficult for him to do any other work during weekends, you know, but just to sit and listen to people's problems. I would say the time that he, you know, he spent with people led him to setting up all these projects that one sees around Steve. And uh, they led to a greater conviction on his part that there was a need, a greater need, for blacks to really pull up their socks, you know, to, to begin to do things themselves. Biko was undaunted by the apparently insuperable obstacles of the apartheid system. As a medical student, he formed the first black South African Students' Union. Then, forced to give up his studies and confined to his hometown, he started a trust fund for the families of political prisoners. And a fund to help young blacks get educated in town, he started a trust fund for the families of political prisoners. And a fund to help young blacks get education. One thing that I think was very important in his drive with about everything that he handled is that he was a man who liked challenges. Uh, he would take on any challenge, anything that one would see as perhaps too difficult or perhaps, uh, you know, bit much more advanced than can be expected uh, of his capability. That's the one thing that he'd want to take on just to prove that he can make it. This clinic just outside King Williamstown is a monument to Biko's work. 
As a would-be doctor, he knew about the need for health care, but he also saw the clinic, which he created, as a practical way of developing self-reliance. The clinic has been open for two years. Despite its success, the government eventually banned Biko from having anything to do with it. Today, the clinic has to buy drugs on the commercial market for TB and for immunisation, drugs normally available free in South Africa. Nowhere was Biko's influence more felt than in the new movement of black consciousness or the pride in being black. Steve Biko was one of the founders of the BPC, the Black People's Convention, in 1972. This movement dedicates itself to the overthrow of apartheid by non-violent means. Many of its members have been persecuted, detained or forced into exile. The current president is Kenneth Rashidi. Is there any hope? of a non-violent, non-racist future for South Africa. Right now, what I can say, from my personal point of view, is that uh, the ball is definitely with the, with the government. Black people still accept, and they accept our weight, that uh, black and white people are here to stay together. But our main worry in our positions, in trying to promote this kind of non-racial society, is that the government is clamping on the black people harder than ever. And this is becoming it, it may become difficult in the future for us to convince the black people that the real issue is that black and white must live together here. But we are up to try our best to, to, let, to let people realize that. We understand and appreciate the problems that the government is facing. Anybody who is in power doesn't want to relinquish power. Despite the fact that he realizes that he's a minority group, they call us racists when they are racist and they are in the minority, but they want to rule us, which is, to me, it's a, it's, it's, it's an, it's a social ethic which can't be accepted anywhere. Our organization is not anti-white. We are just purely pro-black. Our intention is that uh, the black man has got to be on his own to solve his problems. The black man can't solve his problems with a man that is oppressing him. He's got to be on his own, and we've got to be unified, we've got to be solidified, so that we can face our problems. And that is what the government is fearing, because this is gaining momentum and we are marching towards the total unity of the black men in South Africa. Biko himself was detained by the security police four times, but such actions didn't stop King Williamstown becoming the centre of black radicalism. By coincidence, only last year, World in Action, in documenting the political repression of blacks after the June riots, highlighted the case of a detainee who was a friend and associate of Biko's and was, like him, restricted to King Williamstown. Mapetlu Muhapi allegedly hanged himself with two pairs of jeans while in custody. Last year, his widow spoke to us. What happened to the two doctors? Your two doctors have been present at that post-mortem. They are both detained at the present moment under internal act, the internal security act. What was the date of the post-mortem? The date of the postmortem was the sixth. So he died on the fifth of August. The postmortem yes. was on the sixth of the August. Sixth, yeah. Then on the thirteenth of August, the first doctor was detained. And when was the second doctor detained? The second doctor was detained on the twenty-ninth. He was one of the speakers at the funeral. A year after the event, there's still no satisfactory explanation of how Mapetlu Mahati came to die. People detained by the security police have no contact with the outside world and are at the mercy of their custodians. Mrs. Hanoli Muhapi was herself detained in August about the same time as Steve Biko. No one knows where she is. When something like this happens, they don't find it to be very funny because it has been happening for a long, long time. And uh, this is uh, the pattern. I mean, you can realize that if Muhapi died last year and his wife now is in detention, you can imagine where the kids are. But I mean, they're, they're all right. Black people are with them. We were able to trace the Muhapi children in the township, two little girls, Konedi, aged two, and Motebo, aged four. With their father dead and their mother detained, they were being looked after by neighbours. It was for circumstances like these that Biko set up the trust fund for political prisoners. I think that the state, the Nationalist Party government, is crazed with fear for blacks. After nearly 30 years of exploiting 
racial prejudice by a white minority. They're now caught up in the web of their own bigotry and fear. How has his death affected you personally? Well, it's now um, nearly two weeks since we had the news, and it's still extremely hard to believe that this has happened. Personally, it's, it seems hard to accept that we won't see him again. And frankly, I don't know when all the activity of trying to find out who is responsible for it is over, when the inquest is over and such prosecutions as follow according to what's indicated by the inquest, I frankly don't know how my wife and I are going to adjust after that. At the moment we kept very busy with involvement in this process, but after that we'll have to face up to the fact that uh, he isn't there for us to see anymore. This is the younger of Steve Biko's two sons, Samora, aged two. He was born on August the 15th, 1975. He never had a first birthday party because on August the 15th, 1976, his father's friend, Mapetli Muhapi, was buried. His father was there for his second birthday, but three days later he was detained and never returned. Samora still runs to the telephone expecting to hear his father's voice. Samora's mother and Steve Biko's widow is Mrs Nsiki Biko. Well, even if it were he was on a strike, I don't think it would have killed him. Yes, especially, you know, quoting the number of days they say he, he, he was refusing food. I don't think that would have killed him. Unless they were giving him bad food. I know he doesn't like bad food, of course. But I don't think that would have killed him. Was he a strong man? Very much strong. Healthy. <laughs> you, you never get... You, you was never ill. You know, seriously, except for one illness he had, some pneumonia. And after that, he was just strong. He has been a strong man, really. With so many people dead or in detention, do you ever feel like giving up? Well, we do expect, you know, during a struggle, obviously, we expect anything, you know, anything can happen. But I just can't understand why people, you know, are, are not brought before court if they are found guilty or they are charged. Because, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, these detentions and, uh, you know, banning orders, uh, they don't mean anything. I mean, if a man is found guilty or if a man, they find that the man is guilty of some offense, he must be brought before a court of law. This is a list of the 45 people who've died in custody since detention without trial was introduced in 1963. 
Steve Biko was buried in King Williamstown eight days ago. Although 20,000 mourners turned up from all over South Africa, many more were unable to get there because of harassment by the security police. The Anglican funeral turned into one of the biggest political rallies ever seen in South Africa and lasted for five hours. At the end of a day of anger, celebration and tears, one question remained. Would this peaceful ceremony mark the end of attempts to reach a non-violent solution to South Africa's racial problems? a man of peace or a man of truth. 
Steve Biko said, no race possesses the monopoly of beauty, intelligence, force, and there is room for all of us at the rendezvous of victory. Thank you.